So what I'm going to talk about uh, briefly now to sort of set the tone for the, for the rest of the conference is a workshop that was held at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in, in fall of 2009. Now, the, the workshop convened about, about a dozen AGI researchers there, hosted by uh, it, Itamar Arrow, who, who's, who's here tonight from the University of, of Tennessee, and also partially funded by the, the Singularity Institute for, for AI. The workshop was focused on AGI road mapping, trying to gather a bunch of AGI researchers together to figure out what, what could be a viable roadmap to get from where we are now to advanced artificial general intelligence. And as anyone who's been in the AGI or AI field for a while might predict, we did not succeed in having a dozen people agree on anything resembling a, a single roadmap to AGI. But we, we, we did come to some interesting conclusions and commonalities, which we described a little more accurately using the phrase mapping the landscape of, of AGI. So uh, what I want to do now is, is talk a bit about the workshop, what conclusions we came to, what kind of unity of vision we managed to find among a group of diverse AGI researchers, and also what, what was the the diversity of, of, of opinions that, that was pulling us each, each in our own research directions. So it was called the workshop on creating a roadmap toward human level artificial general intelligence. And already there was a lot of argument in coming up with that name because no, no one, or what does human level mean? Are we really all after a human level? Some people are trying to emulate humans in detail. Some maybe just wanting to make something really smart and defining what is human level itself is kind of contentious once you get away from trying to identify ex exactly with the, with, with the human mind. But we, we were able to agree on that fairly well as a sort of a, approximate term to describe what, what we're after. And uh, this slide is the name of the, of the participants. You see we had Sam Adams from, from industry, then uh, a, a couple triple AI fellows, Stuart Shapiro, John, John Soa, and then Inamar, Josha, Josh Hall, who are here, and a, a couple guys who are at least one psychologist, actually, to, to, to round out the group of, of AI people. And Rod Ferland from Singularity University, bring more of a, of a futurist perspective. And one thing that we all pretty much agreed on starting out the workshop is that there was some palpable difference between what Ray Kurzweil had called narrow AI and what we thought of as AGI, or, or general AI, and what Ray called in his early book strong AI, but that term had some baggage from earlier, earlier AI theory. And this is not a consensus among all people in, in the field. I mean, some people really feel that, that that distinction isn't worth drawing, and it's all just AI. And there, there may be some validity to that, but all of us at the workshop felt it was also interesting to draw the narrow AI versus AGI distinction, wherein... Narrow AI focuses on making systems that solve particular problems that seem to require intelligence when humans solve them. And then AGI, by contrast, focuses on systems that can solve many, many different kinds of problems without requiring specialized reprogramming for, for each one. And I like to think of AGI as the ability of a system to achieve a variety of complex goals in a variety of complex environments. In reality, that has to be done using limited computational resources. One of the many things we couldn't all agree on at the workshop was what the heck AGI really means. Everyone sort of has their own definition, and I think that's, that's true among the researchers here as well. There are various formalizations of general intelligence and their various practical understandings. And they, they have a lot of overlap, but there are also some differences. I mean, we, we found a, a quote by uh, Nils Nilsson, one of the, the old founders of AI who, who built Sh Shaky the Robot and, and did a, a bunch of other stuff. And the way he looked at it was kind of practical. Like, uh, I claim achieving real human level AI would necessarily imply most of the tasks humans perform for pay could be automated. Rather than work toward this goal of automation by building special purpose systems, I argue for the development of general purpose, educable systems that can learn and be taught to perform any of the thousands of jobs that humans can perform. Joining others who've made similar proposals, I advocate beginning with a system with 
minimal, although extensive, built-in capabilities, an interesting hedge. These would have to include the ability to improve through learning, along with many other abilities. And I think that's that's from a, a AI magazine article in 2005, many decades after he started his research career. But I think it's a it's a fair practical summary of what we're talking about with human level AGI. I mean, we may ultimately be able to go far beyond that level, but that that would certainly be an interesting start at at, at, at any rate. But how do you get there? Now, th this slide is, is maybe not that easy to read, but at AGI 10, John Laird, who's one of the key authors of the, of the SOAR architecture, which again comes from a long, long legacy of, of American AI work, they laid out some systematic requirements for cognitive architectures, environments, and, and tasks for AGI, which I also think made a lot of sense. I mean, a, an AGI system should be able to deal with new tasks without requiring reprogramming. It should be able to somehow realize a symbol system, which could be through emerging it internally or by having it built into its, its architecture. It needs to be able to represent and use modality-specific knowledge, large bodies of diverse knowledge, knowledge at various levels of, of generality, beliefs independent of what it's perceiving at the moment, rich hierarchical control knowledge, metacognitive knowledge, deliberation both bounded and unbounded, learning of, of diverse varieties, learning that's incremental and, and online. It should be able to operate in environments that are complex with diverse interacting objects, dynamic environments, with tasks at multiple time scales where other agents impact its performance. The tasks must be complex, diverse, and novel that it's able to deal with. Its computational resources are limited, and it's a lifelong system. It can keep on existing in the world continually from one task to another, l learning as it goes. And, of course, listing these requirements is, is a lot easier than fulfilling them, but it, it, it's still interesting to have some, some clarity on, on what you're after. And Sam Adams from IBM, the author of the Joshua Blue AGI architecture, liked to view this in developmental psychology terms, which is somewhat amenable to, to my way of thinking as well, looking in terms of Piaget's hierarchy of individual capabilities, going from infantile through concrete up through uh, formal stages of thinking, and Vygotsky's hierarchy of social cultural engagement, where you're able to get more and more adapted to working with other agents, and looking at AGI as we develop it, as moving moving forward on, on both of these scales. Now, where things got more controversial was trying to settle on exactly what practically do you do to achieve all these kind of highfalutin sounding aspects of general intelligence. And what we had hoped when starting out the workshop was that we could agree on one sort of testing scenario, one environment where we could all put our AGI systems in the same environment and let them play in that environment and have a common set of tasks at which you would compare everybody's system. And this was a very nice idea, but not surprisingly, what came out was more that everyone sort of favored the environment that was similar to the ones they were working with, that their AGI system was, or proto-AGI system was, was, was good at, at dealing with. And... This was not terribly surprising, nor incredibly disappointing, but it, it, it was interesting. And these are some of the scenarios that were proposed and fleshed out. One with general video game learning. Basically take an AGI system, throw any video game at it, with or without instructions, let it figure out how to play and do well. I mean, any one video game you could address with a narrow AI system, but to be able to deal with any of the many video games out there without specific preparation is an interesting task. The one that, that is dearest to my heart is uh, early childhood education, basically a, a robot preschool or a virtual preschool where you can structure the tasks similar to a human preschool curriculum. Then uh, Joshua talks a lot about story and, and scene comprehension, and it, it's arguable that if, if you can understand, say, a scene from a Hollywood movie and explain what happened and answer general questions about what happened. That may be what you call an AGI hard problem and may also be a decent path to development of, of AGI systems. And that, that seems to suit itself fairly well to, to competitions and, and, and shared tasks. The reading comprehension curriculum is something that Stuart Shapiro was, was interested in. Just take 
reading children's picture books first through sixth grade and answering questions on it like kids have to do. And some of us argued that may be easier to sort of game with narrow AI systems. So that, that, it's not clear to me personally. School learning going beyond the reading curriculum to more and more subjects. Steve Wozniak, the, the co-founder of Apple, had proposed what we like to call the coffee test. He said, it'll be a really, really long time until anyone can make a robot that can go into a random house in the US and figure out how to make a cup of coffee. And uh, Josh Hall was a strong advocate of that as an AGI environment. And you can see that involves integrating a lot of things. You got to go in through the door. You got to find where the coffee grounds are kept. You got to figure out what all the buttons on the coffee maker do. I mean, there's th th there's a lot of stuff you have to do there. Now, of course, you can see in this list of scenarios that if what you're working on is robotics, you may like the coffee test better. If what you're working on is natural language processing, you may like reading comprehension better. So everyone kind of agreed on what the end goal is in terms of Nils Nelson's rundown and Laird and Ray's rundown of, of a list of, of things you have to do. But what you want to do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, in what order, is, is harder for different researchers with, with different paradigms to, to agree on, even though the, the end goal is agreed more commonly. We had a little more agreement on a sort of laundry list of what competencies are required for, for human level AGI. And you could break this down in a lot of ways by looking at cognitive science tech, textbooks, by looking at AI papers. There's, there's fairly good agreement now on what kinds of things a human level mind needs to do. And this list will bore everyone because it's all obvious, right? There's perception, actuation, memory, learning, reasoning, planning, attention, motivation, emotion, modeling self and others, social interaction, communication, quantitative understanding, building and, and creation. And for each of these, you can run down a long, a long list of specific in, instantiations of that. Say, for dealing with emotion, you must be able to express emotion, to understand emotion, to perceive emotion, to, to control emotions. And all these things are important. We could all agree all these things are important. But again, what order you want to proceed in with these and which ones are the core, the crux of intelligence and which ones are kind of things you can tack on afterwards it, it is a much harder thing for all the researchers to, to agree on. What it did seem is that for a particular scenario, say the virtual preschool or, or the coffee test, for each scenario, you could look at each competency area, say learning in the virtual preschool, modeling self and other in the virtual preschool, or say communication in the context of the coffee test. Once you have a scenario and a certain competency that interests you, then you could figure out how to put those together and generate some tasks based on that, which then becomes a huge matrix. And each scenario and each competency, what, what, what is the task? And it, it all starts to become quite diverse and quite complicated. Now, you can contrast all that with, say, the definition of general intelligence given by Marcus Huter and, and Shane Legg in, in some of their work, where they just define general intelligence as, in essence, the ability to solve, our, to solve through reinforcement arbitrarily complex reward functions where you wait, you wait each environment in which a reward function exists by by the the Solomonoff Levin prior, and this is a this is a very elegant mathematical definition of general intelligence, which seems to contrast with this horrible laundry list of scenarios and functionalities. On the other hand, humans are not fully general intelligences, and we are maybe fully general in principle, given an infinite Turing tape to ride on. But in, in terms of our practical lifespan and resources. We're heavily adapted to particular environments that we that we evolved for. So we didn't come to any grand conclusion. I'm sorry if you, if you were waiting for one. Um, we we wrote a, a paper on this, which, which, which should, should appear shortly, kind of running through the various possibilities and trying to organize them in a sensible way. And part of the conclusion is that human level intelligence is not that simple and, and well organized of a thing. I mean, humans are evolved systems. We evolved for certain environments within certain physiological constraints. We're not AIXIs or, or arbitrarily intelligent 
mathematical super intelligences and because of this messiness of human in intelligence and the diversity of, of functions that we've evolved to fulfill there there is a certain diversity to the the field of of AGI insofar as it's aimed at, at emulating something vaguely like human human level AI and to an extent I think that this diversity is is a, a feature rather than, than a bug it, it it's okay it, it's led to the AGI field having a lot of of different approaches beyond the ones we considered here I mean we're going to hear an excellent talk shortly about kind of proto AGI work oriented toward driverless cars and that's a scenario we didn't consider in in this workshop but you could also look at that as a path to AGI there's a lot there's a lot of a lot of possible pathways and the the main point is really the one we started out with in terms of not focusing on just a, a single narrow task area of say driving a car through the streets of, of San Francisco or playing chess or playing Go or analyzing genetic data but rather trying to build systems that can achieve a variety of complex goals in a variety of complex environments including the ability to do kind of un unpredictable things that you didn't program the system to do I think this can be approached in a lot of of different ways through different scenarios and that the various sub components of human intelligence could be approached in, in a lot of of different orders and none of none of us knows yet which is going to be the path to lead to the best success so it's great we can have a conference like this with so many different approaches represented and uh, I guess Jürgen wake up uh, so the great uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber will now I introduce our, our first uh, keynote speaker so Jürgen uh, Jürgen was the chair of last year's AGI conference and is, is without a doubt one of the world's leading AGI researchers <laughs> 